The claim is that 2,000 years ago, God's Son became one of us so that we could see what he's like and hear his call into relationship with him. reading is taken from Luke chapter 7 verses 36 to 50. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he cancelled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt cancelled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. 
Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Here ends the second lesson. Please do take a seat. And uh, let me ask you to exercise your imagination for a moment. Imagine that it's Monday morning and uh, you're on your way to work. I know that for some of the student body that is stretching imagination already, but uh, hang in there. You're on your way to work or whatever, and suddenly you are kidnapped, you're bundled into a car, sedated, and the next thing you've woken up in a room which is completely dark. You can't see anything, you can't hear anything, but you hope that it's happened to someone else. You hope that you are not in there on your own. And in fact, after the hours go by, you start telling yourself that there is someone else in there with you because you don't want to believe that you are on your own. Now, a lot of people think that Christian faith is like that, that it is just wishful thinking, just believing that there is a God when there is not a shred of evidence. So people often talk about faith as a leap in the dark. If that's what you think about Christian faith, you are way off the truth. Just go back to that imaginary Monday morning and imagine this second scenario. This time you've woken up in the darkened room and uh, you can hear nothing, you can see nothing. You have no reason to believe that there is anyone else in the room and then suddenly the door opens, a shaft of light falls in, a person steps through and says, I'll get you out of here, trust me. And having wondered whether you will trust him, you decide you will and you get up and you follow him. That second scenario is 
the true picture of what Christian faith is like. It is not wishful thinking. It is not a leap in the dark. Christianity claims that like your rescuer in that second scenario, God in person has stepped into the room of this world in the person of Jesus. The claim is that 2,000 years ago, God's son became one of us so that we could see what he's like and hear his call into relationship with him. And Christian faith is a response of trust to Jesus. That's what we're going to look at tonight. Now, there are two big faith questions that people usually ask. The first is this, how can I believe God is there? And if that's what you're asking, Christianity's answer is, look at Jesus. Look at how he claimed to be God's son become human. And look at his life and his miracles and his own rising again from the dead, which backs up that claim. And ask yourself, what do you make of that? Now, in order to do that, you have to read from the Bible, from the four Gospels, the accounts in the Bible of Jesus' life, death, and rising again from the dead. And you may be thinking, the trouble is, I don't trust them. That's the chicken and egg problem. And I want to say, uh, I'm not asking you to trust them straight off. That's called being gullible. Christians are just saying, give it a look, or give it another look, if it's a while since you've done so. If trusting the Bible is your sticking point, one thing you could do is um, pick up this little booklet which I wrote. Uh, It's called Why Trust Them. When it first appeared, uh, one of our female students, whose boyfriend had recently split up with her, came up to me and said, I see that you've written a little pamphlet on men. Um, And I I said, no, it's not about men. As it says on the cover, uh, it's about the four Gospels, who wrote, when, and can we trust them. Um, So they're on the welcome desk at the back or through in the student supper. So the first big faith question is, how can I believe God is there? And you could spend a whole talk on that. The other one is, how can I believe God accepts me? Which moves from more intellectual to more personal. Can I have a relationship with God if he is there? Can I know I'm accepted? Can I know that he loves me? And it's that second question I want to look at tonight. I want to answer it from that reading that we had earlier from Luke's Gospel. So would you turn back with me to it? It's on page four of the service sheet, or if you prefer looking in the Bibles in the seats, it's on page 1036. This is an incident in Jesus's life where two people make big discoveries about where they really stand with God. One is a man who thinks that he is in relationship with God and discovers that he's not. The other is a woman who thinks she couldn't possibly be in relationship with God, and by the end of the story, she is. And maybe you will make one of those two discoveries about yourself tonight. So let me read from verse 36. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Uh, The Pharisees, as you may remember from GCSE, uh, they took God's law, the Ten Commandments and so on, very seriously indeed. For example, to help themselves keep the Sabbath law, they came up with a list of 39 things that you shouldn't do, including carrying anything, cooking anything, and tying a knot. So woe betide you if your shoelace came undone early in the day. One of them invites Jesus for dinner, and in those days, they didn't sit on chairs. Like it says, they reclined at the table. So you have to think coffee table, in our terms, low table. They'd be lying down with their heads propped up at the table end, feet away from the table so that the cheese course doesn't come on too early. So verse 37, verse 37, when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, She brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now, when it says she'd lived a sinful life, it means a particularly notorious life. Uh, Maybe she had been a prostitute. Maybe she'd had a whole series of sexual partners. We don't know. Whatever it was, people regarded her as morally the lowest of the low. And I guess in our culture, that would be the paedophile. 
Anyway, she hears Jesus is at this meal. She gathers up this incredibly expensive bottle of perfume and she blows it on him in one go in this extraordinary gesture of love. Meanwhile, the Pharisee is looking at her as something that the cat has dragged in. She is the dead mouse on his carpet. But he doesn't first and foremost pass judgment on her, but on Jesus. Look at verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, in other words, really from God in some way, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner, and would not dream of associating with her. Now just ask yourself, what idea of God lies behind Simon's thinking there? Surely it is the idea that God accepts people if they are good enough. It's the idea that you can arrange the human race along a line and down at the bottom end are people like paedophiles and at the top end are people like doctors who work for the Red Cross in war zones. And somewhere there is a cut-off point above which God says, you are good enough for me to accept you. And Simon obviously put himself in that end and he obviously thought that this woman was so far down here she would never have a hope of making the cut. That was Simon's idea of God, and it may be yours as well. And if it is, you will know it, because you will live either in pride or in despair. On the one hand, if you think your life really is good enough for God, you will live in pride, looking down on other people. There was a very shrewd column in the Times a while back about why paedophiles make such high-profile news. And among other things, it said this, quote, We love our paedophiles because they make the rest of us feel secure. If we can brand one group of people as evil, we can reassure ourselves that we are in a different category altogether. That is pride. On the other hand, if you're more honest, this idea that God will accept you if you are good enough will lead you to despair. For example, I was speaking one time at a dinner party late on for giving people a chance to hear something of the Christian message and discuss it. There was a lovely Muslim woman there and she said to me very early on, I honestly think this is a waste of time for me. I I really came for the food, um, a bit like George. Um, But um, basically think what you believe and what I believe are exactly the same. And so to show her that that wasn't the case, I said, look, imagine that on our way home this evening, we are both knocked down by a bus and killed. My usual light-hearted after-dinner banter. Um, I said to her, now, on your belief, you will meet Allah. How do you think it'll go? She said, well, I believe that Allah will weigh my good deeds and my bad deeds in the balance. And if the good outweigh the bad, uh, he'll let me in. And if it's the other way, he won't. I said, how do you think the balance is looking right now? And she paused and she said, "Um, not good. And I pushed it a bit and I said, do you think that will change? And after another pause, she very honestly said, no, I don't think it will. Turned out she was living quietly in despair because of that Muslim idea of God, which is only one of many variations on the theme, that God will accept you if you're good enough. But this incident says God is not like that. Because look at Jesus, and you're looking at God. A friend of mine was um, brought up like George, um, going to church, and he says that Sunday by Sunday, he refused to listen to the sermon on the grounds that he was sure he was just going to be told to be good. And he said, I had my parents telling me to be good, I had my older brother telling me to be good, I had a school full of teachers telling me to be good, I didn't need one more person in my life telling me to be good. So it was a brick building. He said, I used to count the bricks at the front. He said, during the average sermon, I would get to between 900 and 1,000 bricks. He said it was crashingly boring. And he said, one day, it struck me that the sermon could not possibly be more boring. And so I decided to tune in. And he said, I got the shock of my life. All those years, I've been assuming that they were going to be telling me to be good, when what in fact he did was to tell me what Jesus had done to bring me into relationship with God. That is what the rest of this incident is about. So have a look down, if you would, at verse 40. This guy, Simon, has just thought to himself, if Jesus really was from God, he would never accept a person like this. And verse 40, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. 
Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 50,000 pounds and the other 5,000, adjusting for 2008 prices, although they've probably fallen since I wrote that. <laughs> Verse 42, neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? I don't know who have been your great debt cancellers, um, but for me, it's, it's been the parents. I don't know if you know that story of uh, the son who's away at university, and uh, one day the wife says to the husband, when did we last hear from Ben? And uh, the husband says, um, I can't remember. I'll just go and look it up in the checkbook. Well, that was me. Um, and it does make you want to love them more. Um, so which of the debtors will love the debt canceller more? Verse 43, Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. And now he holds up that little story as a mirror because he wants Simon to see himself and the woman in the mirror of that story. Verse 44, Then Jesus turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. In other words, you didn't offer me any of the basic courtesies, no handshake, no drinks and nibbles, nothing. Whereas she made this extraordinary gesture of love. Therefore, I tell you, verse 47, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little in response, and by implication, he who has not been forgiven at all does not love Jesus at all in response. Let me say what Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying, because this woman has shown me this love, therefore, as a reward, I've just this minute forgiven her. He's saying, because this woman has shown me this great love, you've just seen evidence that I have already forgiven her on a previous occasion. They'd met before. Because Simon, like you've just said, you know who's had their debt cancelled by how much they love the debt canceller. So let's do a bit of reconstruction. This woman, verse 37, says, had lived a sinful life. She is now, in this incident, a changed person because she had met Jesus on some previous occasion and she had heard from him both the bad news and the good news, which you have to believe, you have to trust, if you're going to come to faith in Jesus. The bad news is this. Every one of us is morally in debt to God. To pick up and run with Jesus' language, every one of us owes God a life lived the way he wants it lived. Every one of us has failed to pay. That's why in his little story he begins... Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. The moneylender stands for God. What Jesus needed Simon to see was that there were two sinners in the room. Not just this woman, but Simon himself. Now, obviously, he had sinned differently to her, but the point is he had still sinned. And the truth is we have got to compare ourselves not with one another, but with God and with how God says he wants us to live in the Bible. Now Jesus summed that up like this, I quote. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength and all your mind and all your soul. In other words, in every area of your life, at all times, live consciously to please God and live by his standards. So there's your first box. Do you want to tick that one? And then Jesus added, the other, the other standard is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, in every encounter with every other person in your life, treat them as you would want to be treated yourself. So there's your second box. Do you want to tick that? I remember being driven down the motorway by a friend, Richard, and noticing he was doing about 85, 90, and I said to him, uh, what about the speed limit? And at that moment, a Porsche shot by in the, uh, in the fast lane and disappeared. And Richard said, well, what about him? To which, of course, the correct reply was, well, what about him? He's speeding, you're speeding. It's just that you're speeding at a different speed because you've only got a Vauxhall Cavalier, which 
you know, wouldn't know what 100 miles an hour was if it came up and knocked on the door. I didn't say that. Um, and if I've just offended you, can I say my first car was a Vauxhall Cavalier and I loved it dearly. Um, the point is, what you've got to compare yourself with on the motorway is 70. Not him or him, 70. And what you've got to compare yourself in the things of God is God and what he says about how he wants you to live in the Bible. Not him, not her. It's not my judgment of myself that matters. It's not the fact that my friends judge me to be nice, which is any assumption. Um, it's God's judgment that matters. And the bad news, which deep down in our consciences we know, is that we are all morally in debt to God. And God is offended. And we are in trouble. And this woman heard that and admitted it. And the question is, have you admitted it? Will you admit it? Because that is what you have to do on the way to coming to faith in Jesus. Because Christian faith is trusting Jesus to accept you, not on the basis of your goodness, but on the basis of his forgiveness. And if you feel and admit no need for forgiveness, you will never come to faith. But then this woman also heard the good news from Jesus. She heard him saying words to this effect. I have come on behalf of God my Father to say, I will forgive all your moral debt. So turn to me and start life again with me in my rightful place as Lord of your life. And that is still God's promise and God's call to each of us today. And this woman believed it. So if you look down to the very last verse, verse 50, Jesus said to this woman, your faith, in other words, your believing my promise of forgiveness, has saved you. That is, saved you from a life out of relationship with God and heading for certain judgment to a life in friendship with God and heading for certain welcome in heaven. Now, many people say you can't be certain like that because they're working on that idea that God will accept you if you are good enough. And the if is just a built-in uncertainty. In fact, it's a built-in impossibility. And that is what you find in all the human religions of the world and all the watered-down versions of Christianity. What is unique about Jesus is that he does offer certainty. Certainty about where you and I stand with God because it depends not on our goodness, but on his forgiveness. So look at how he assures this woman in verse 48. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. In other words, let's talk about the past. Be assured that everything you have done is forgiven because you've trusted my promise. Then look on again to verse 50. Jesus also said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In other words, let's talk about the future now. Be assured that God will not hold any of your future sins against you either, but will forgive you whenever you screw up, as George put it earlier. And between those two assurances comes the obvious question in verse 49. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? In other words, what right does Jesus have to tell you or me your sins, your offenses against God are wiped? And the answer is he has the right because he is God, because he's God the Son, and because he came into this world to pay off our moral debts. That's what he was doing when he died on the cross. The one person who had never sinned. So the one person who was infinitely in credit with God his Father and uniquely placed to pay off your moral debt, your moral debt, your moral debt, your moral debt, my moral debt, so that we could be forgiven. And this woman believed that too. And again, the question is, do you, will you believe that? Because Christian faith is trusting Jesus' promise that through his death, all your sins, past and future, will be forgiven and that you are securely accepted by God forever. And that is settled if you trust in him. 
Now, I remember preaching that in another sermon, and someone came steaming, me, steaming up to me on the door afterwards and told me, you should never say that to people. And I said, why not? He said, because they will just go out and sin. I said, well, why would it have that effect on him? And he said, because you've just told them it doesn't matter what they do. I said, no, that isn't what I told them. I said, their acceptance with God does not depend on what they do. And he then said, but if people believe that, won't they just go out and do what they want? So I decided to unsettle him by saying, yes, they will. He said, so you're agreeing with me? I said, no, because you haven't twigged that it is impossible to believe that someone has died for your forgiveness and truly take that on board and to live unchanged. It changes what you want. For example, the story is told of a group of tourists being shown round one of the cathedrals in Paris earlier in the last century. And their tour guide stopped them in front of this huge painting of the crucifixion. And at that moment, just as he was about to begin his, his spiel, the bishop himself walked up. And he said, there's actually a story about that painting. He said, 50 years or so ago, Paris was full of gangs of young street kids. And the initiation ceremonies and dares into these gangs uh, were quite something. He said, I know of a 10-year-old boy, and the initiation dare for him was to have to come into this cathedral, to stand in front of this painting publicly, and to say at the top of his voice, Jesus Christ, you died for me, and I couldn't give a damn. And he said, this little boy came in, stood in front of the picture, looked up at it, and said, Jesus Christ, you died for me, and he couldn't finish. And he turned tail, and he ran out of the cathedral. And one of the more thoughtful tourists in that group said, how did you know that story? And the bishop said, I was the boy. You see, when, like that boy, you grasp that God's son died for you because you're not good enough and never will be and needed forgiveness, it changes what you want. You don't have to become a bishop, I should add. Uh, don't, don't let that stand in the way um, of coming to Christ. So I remember a friend, for example, being on the point of turning to Christ, and I asked him what was stopping him. He said two things. I'm not good enough, and I know I couldn't change. And I said, well, on, on the first of those, join the club. That is why forgiveness of sins is such brilliant news. I said, on the second of those, it is precisely the forgiveness of sins and knowing that you are accepted without having to work for it, that changes what you want, that makes you want to live for him in a way that you didn't before. Well, maybe like this man, Simon, you came thinking that you were good enough for God and you've realized that you're not. Or maybe like this woman, you came knowing that you're not good enough for God and now realizing that that is absolutely no obstacle to coming into a relationship with him, even tonight, even now, because of what his son did for you when he died on the cross and rose again. I don't know where you stand tonight in relation to Jesus, but imagine I were to draw another line, this time that represents all the different places where we might stand in relation to him. So at one end of the people who, who, like this woman, can already say, I am trusting Jesus for forgiveness, and albeit very imperfectly, um, I'm trying to live to please him in response, to show him my love in return. At the other end of the line are the people who would say, um, I'm still looking into all of this. I'm not really sure that anything you've said tonight is true. That's, that's where I am. If that is you, thank you for coming and giving it time to listen. Please do keep looking. Um, if you're a student, as Tom and George mentioned earlier, please do join us for Student Christianity Explored, a leaflet like this. Um, if you want to join in with any of the other courses, it's not too late. The leaflet in the service sheet like this tells you about those. But you may be in the middle of my line, and you've done enough thinking. Um, you know this is true. You know enough. Can I say to you, God is calling you to respond to him. And just as he said through his son on earth 2,000 years ago, he is saying to you, through his son now risen from the dead, exactly the same thing. I will forgive all your moral debt, so turn to me 
and start life again with me in my rightful place as Lord. I'm simply going to end with a prayer that would help you to respond to God in that way if you are ready and want to. Let me read through the prayer so that um, it doesn't put anyone on the spot. You can think whether this would be appropriate for you to pray in a moment. I'll just read it through before we pray it. Father God, I admit that I am a sinner and deserve your judgment. But I believe your son died for me, that I might be forgiven. I now come and ask you to forgive me and to help me live for you as my Lord from now on. You may be much further back down the line, so please don't think I'm encouraging you to do anything that you're not ready for. You may already have begun like that, and although there's always a need for fresh forgiveness, there's no need to begin relationship with God again. But if that prayer is appropriate for you, you could echo it in your own mind as we pray it now. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, I admit that I am a sinner and deserve your judgment. But I believe your son died for me that I might be forgiven. I now come and ask you to forgive me. and to help me live for you as my Lord from now on. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer and meant it, can I encourage you to trust that God has heard and answered it? And if that is you, then what the Lord Jesus said to that woman 2,000 years ago is what he is saying to you now. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. In other words, you came here unforgiven. You're able to go away forgiven. You came here out of relationship with God. You're going away at peace with God. If that is you, can I encourage you to pick up a copy of this booklet, Why Jesus, which just goes over the step uh, that I've just been explaining and the step of that prayer. Uh, you'll find it on the welcome desk or through in the student supper. Can I also encourage you to tell another Christian what you've just done so that they can make suggestions as to how to go on from here? Lastly, if you are trusting in Jesus, but you haven't yet been baptized, you haven't received that sign of his forgiveness and his acceptance, then you ought to. And as David reminded us, please just talk to Jonathan, who led most of the service on the door, about that baptism service in two weeks' time.